in terms of like going for it, you got to go for it. Like I did send that email. I did call Lior Cohen four months after that. And I did stay on it. And then when I did see them the second time, I said, look, I would love to get a minute of your time. I would love to do this. But I stayed so informed on what they were doing, on what they were working on, what they had in the works, because people want to talk about their own stuff. So I would make it sometimes about not what I had, but what I wanted to learn more about what they were doing and understand what they were building. People will let you in on that. And if they don't, then you got to keep it moving. There's a little bit of like, why not me? Like, I'm going for it. I'm going to go for it. Whenever I had an idea for a business, I would be like, let's make t-shirts because it needed to feel real. I never built any of those restaurant ideas I had, but all the kids I grew up with are like, remember that thing you did, that element when you made the t-shirts? It was real to them for a minute. You got to go for it and you got to really believe that what you're doing is real. Today on the podcast, we have Rich Kleiman, who I feel a very uh, close synergy with. Your background is was, is very similar to mine, and uh, but like I said, much more extraordinary. And I just wanted, to, I'm, I'm really happy to have you on the podcast. I, I wanted to kind of start just kind of giving us a background on who you are. He is a co-founder, let me just say this part, of 35 Ventures, which is an umbrella company for all sorts of different um, investments over 75. You are a longtime manager of Kevin Durant, business partner. And um, why don't we just start with your background? How did you even start? Because your background was in music initially and how you kind of evolved into what you are doing. Yeah, no, I appreciate that intro. And uh, thank you for having me on. I was excited to do this. Um, I guess, you know, I grew up in New York City. Um, I have been a sports fan, probably, honestly, from the second I can even remember being alive. And I know everyone loves sports, but I had an incredible obsession with following like the local New York teams as a kid. It really was all I kind of thought about. And I got a little older and I was a pretty social guy, but like sports was my everything. Um, and I was really fascinated by everybody that was involved. You know, I really obviously wanted to be an athlete when I was young, um, but I was so astute in my mind about the sport, about the game, about the level of basketball. I watched basketball outside of playgrounds. I went to high school games. I played, I went to NBA games. So I understood where I sat in that. And I tried as hard as I could to go as far as I could, but I was pretty okay early on with going, all right, well, whatever I do, I'm gonna be close to the action. Like I wanna be here. And I really chased that most of my life. And when I was introduced to hip hop music and I mean, I was introduced to hip hop music similar as like from as far back as I can remember. But when I first got that entry into that world from a professional standpoint, it gave me the same type energy and the same type of kind of um, adrenaline that like being around sports did. And I, and I knew that the cultures were so intertwined that one way or the other, it would keep me close to it. Um, by being in music. So, you know, I, I, I started in um, the music business. I managed artists, I managed producers, I managed DJs. And I was working on this documentary film for Jay-Z, Fade to Black. And that um, gave me the visibility into him and his life. And then that was like, well, wait, hold up. All these ball players that I have seen my whole life that I thought were the coolest dude in the room, this guy's a little bit cooler. <laughs> I'm really ready to just like follow him. And I got the opportunity to bring my existing music business into Rock Nation and help build what they were starting to do. And then when the sports agency started, uh, I had the opportunity right off the bat and got the support to help them launch it and then really give up everything I had built in music to go do that because they knew how much everything I was doing was really rooted in like my love for sports. And, and, and they knew I was the one that knew the information, the one that like when we did our big fantasy football league 15 years ago, I won the first annual one because I knew all this stuff. Um, and I, and we could talk about our amazing fantasy football league too, because it's, it's been a 15 year running thing, but those guys and that culture that I was uh, exposed to gave me the confidence to be like, I could go do sports now. And once that happened, everything in my life kind of connected back, all the experiences in music, you know, like you said, having issues in college and dealing with that trauma growing up. And I do think figuring out your trauma as a kid 
really is a useful skill in business if it's channeled the right way. Um, and all that kind of culminated in now I had this opportunity to be in sports. And, you know, that's really where my career took its next iteration. Okay, so I want to go from the beginning, right? So I understand what you just said. However, I think that when I when I was like researching you, and I found like I figured out and knew already about your music, then evolution to sports. What I never really saw, and I was curious about, was how you even started in the music business because every everything was like I I know that you managed Wale and uh, was it also like you were partners with uh, Mark? Was it Mark Ronson? Uh, Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. But how did that even happen? So I feel and the reason why I wanted to ask you this is because even before, forget about 35 ventures and everything you've done with Kevin Durant and all that, even to get to that point, usually that to, in a, with a lot of people's careers is like the is the pinnacle. Right. How did that even happen? What was the qualities about you as a child um, that kind of allowed you even those opportunities? How'd you get that first job in music even? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I purposefully tried to speed my story up because sometimes I can go really long winded and I don't want to act like I'm that important where you need to hear all the details. But if you would like to know, I'm I would. Because I'd like to know, because I really think the devil is in the details. I think that a lot yeah. of times, right, people just kind of like, kind of like glaze over all those like little intricacies that what makes people really successful. Um, and yet, you know, yeah. like I said, I want to know, like, I want to go, I want to know exactly those, those skill set, that skill set or what that grit was and how it kind of culminated even to that from yeah. to there. And then we how, can move from How there. deep do you and your guests go? How, does your audience just talk uh, uh, business or you really want me to tell you some details? I want real details. Um, I mean, it depends on who the person is and how interesting, to be honest, how, how interesting I find them. I find you very interesting because, um, of just even what you've like what you've accomplished i wasn't just like blowing smoke up your ass like i think it's amazing when somebody who kind of like does it really on their own through grit and hustle and like really builds those things from like you know it's momentum right like yeah. you you had success in one thing and you leveraged it into something else and you leverage it again and you keep on leveraging that success and um that's really like my philosophy yeah. and so i want to know your story in detail, like I know, like okay. even when your story, when you were 13, like talk, yeah. talk about that, you know? All right. I will. I mean, uh, so I, um, I, I grew up in New York city and I, I think in the eighties, uh, and nineties, there was a real middle class in New York city. Right. So it was like, I did have the luxuries of being able to go to private school, but you know, I maybe didn't get to go on Christmas vacation, which was cool. Right. I mean, I was privileged from, from that standpoint. Um, so you but, did, did you have a lot of money growing up or middle class really? Like were you no, kind I of think there was a real middle class, but I lived well. But like if I had a house and then I went over to a friend of mine's house, one may have five people that were living in a one bedroom and then one right. may have seven bedrooms on Park Avenue. You know, I was always exposed to all walks of life and I had a really incredible mix of friends from you know a very small age and I always wanted to be around people and I always wanted to socialize and I always walk right up to people and start a conversation. So I had you know a real uh, understanding at a really young age about, to be honest, the difference, maybe too young, the difference in like what people had and didn't have. And I, I had a homeless uncle that I didn't really understand because I was like, well, hold up. If, if we have this house and we're all chilling, why, how do we have? A, how do I have an uncle that's homeless? Um, so I really was like pretty, like thoughtful about. Well, hold up, there's more to this, you know. Like he's not well, and circumstance. And I, I used to ask my dad, like, well, you know, I don't understand why we don't send him money. And he was like, I send him a Western Union every month, and I really paid attention to that stuff. And I also really loved my neighborhood. I've always loved my neighborhood. I loved like the guy who ran the newsstand. I loved the guy who ran the hot dog stand. I loved the guy who ran the dry cleaner. And I really found them to be fascinating. I had a lot of respect for like the wad of money the hot dog stand guy had and how long he had to be out there. Uh, and I just thought that stuff was pretty cool. Um, and I really, I really put so much attention and focus at a young age on sports, on uh, girls on um, business. Were you curious? Was, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, 
What's that one quality that you think that you even had as a kid that got you to that place? Is it curiosity? Is it that you were paying attention yeah. to other details and being yeah, observant? I really, I, I, well, to, I observe. I like to watch people and observe people. And I, I like I read people and I, I'm very curious. I ask a ton of questions and I have a really good memory. And I think that that allowed me to really like build equity in my relationships because people do care when you listen and you can remember. And, and, I, and I have a lot of empathy and I always wanted to make sure that people around me and my friends and everyone close to me was okay, always. And, you know, my uncle being homeless affected me and then I wanted to make sure every homeless person I walked by, I always gave money to. The problem was my parents had a horrible marriage and it was loud and toxic and volatile and I hated it. And I was really in, in the middle of it all. I got myself in the middle of it and I had an older brother that did it and that was his way of dealing with it, which was cool. But when my parents got divorced when I was 14 um, and my dad moved out and my brother went to school and I was with my mom um, and she hates when I talk about this and says that I have a different uh, recollection of this reality. But that's not true because I know my memory and I have other sources. But, um, you know, she it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't a safe, comforting home and environment. So I I didn't want to be in school anymore. And, and, the, and I hated school. And I, that sucks. And I hate saying that because my kids do so well in school and I want them to do well and I encourage it and I'm, I respect it, but I just hated school, mm -hmm. not going. I went every day. I socialized. I wanted to never miss a thing, but I just hated school. And when my parents got divorced and, and I felt like, well, shit, I don't feel really any safety at home. I want to get out of here. I really hung out with everybody around me in where I grew up that was allowed to be out um, during the week. That was older kids. That was kids that went to you know, the public schools in my neighborhood that didn't get to go to private school and have their parents home telling them everything they had to do and their homework was due. I, I was really more comfortable being free. And I was able to like get through high school and I had a ton of friends, all the different walks of life. My basketball career ended and I went to BU because the only school I got into, I applied to 10 schools, but there was this general studies program that allowed me in at BU. And, you know, unfortunately I had no discipline when I got there. I felt even freer. So I never really went to class. I just never went. And it was so immature. I hate it. My dad didn't have money like that to really, you know, that's what middle class is. That's the difference. He couldn't save up to send me to school, but then also have me blow it. So I really just took it for granted. But I was a hustler. So I had a big bookie operation in college and I was making real money and I was popular and I was out and about. And um, after my freshman year, they kicked me out of the school and I convinced my father to let me stay in Boston for another year, but that I would support myself because I had this money. Right. And I stayed up for one more year, but I was, you know, it wasn't good. It was just like, it wasn't healthy. That's not the life I wanted. I went back to New York. Um, and I ended up really just like the next two years, I didn't do shit. You know, I, like, I, I, I partied, I met people, I traveled, I networked. Um, and I stayed curious and I, and I really though didn't have a focus but the one thing that I always knew would be valuable was a vast network of people, people that I could pull from at anything that I wanted in my life. And that didn't just mean the biggest boss in the room. It meant creative people I met, young artists I met, young producers I met, people anywhere, graphic designers, anyone working in finance, getting their life up and running. And I, I just stayed around people my whole life. So what you say, what was the first job you got to, like, how did you start managing Wale or... Uh, Meek or any of these people? Like, what was that? Who helped you with that job? Was there a person? Was there an opportunity that you capitalized on? No, what happened was two years later, some of my friends that actually went to college graduated, and two of them graduated Cornell and wanted to start an internet company um, focused around uh, hip hop music and culture and community and commerce. And, you know, that's the web now, but this is 1999. And they wanted me to help raise money and introduce them to people that I knew because that was something that I had um, a reputation for. So we raised money and I got this incredible advisory board from relationships I had that was Robert De Niro, Q-Tip, Heavy D, and there were some other like random people on this advisory board. Wow. We raised some money. We threw a major uh, launch party in the Hamptons at Mark Ronson and Q-Tip DJ. And then we like the company kind of went under, but all of a sudden, I got it. And I was like, I get it. You got to really do the work. And if you love what you do, it gives you even more of a battery in your back to do the work. And I knew I loved 
all of that, basketball, sports, hip hop, the, the art, everything that encompassed what I was seeing being built and getting artists and producers to interact with the website gave me relationships and it led me to then starting in my music career. And there is like one or two things that happened that then introduced me to the Mark Ronsons and Wale's of the world. But that was really that job and those two guys giving me an opportunity. And mind you, those two guys now are the CEO of Acorns and one of them is the CEO of Stock Twits. The one that's the CEO of Acorns, Noah Kerner, has already sold a major marketing and lifestyle business. And Rishi, who's my who is my other partner, is incredibly successful. You know, so that really taught me everything I needed to know about being a professional. And then that's when my kind of career started. So then you would say that really like your social networking, your ability to kind of create relationships was really kind of, and the curiosity piece was kind of how you kind of launched everything really. Um, yeah. Cause you were able like, listen, you got Robert De Niro and all these people like that, that to me is not exactly an easy task when you're a kid. Right. Yeah. I mean, I do, I do like gloss over it. Like, um, I obviously, you know, had, I lived in New York city and, Where you had a lot of connections very, and networking. Yeah, and, and, well, but I, and I'm also, I value those relationships, you know, and I stay in touch with people and I reciprocate favors and I'm, and I'm conscious of it, you know, and I don't ask for anything. And the relationships that I have through the years, through business, I keep in touch with everybody. It's not easy to do, but that's something that I made a real focus of my life and my career. I figured that that was something that I could do and that I could do well, even when I didn't think I had any real traditional skills. But what happens is experience is undefeated. And as I started to do more and more, I was like, oh, yeah, I've done this. I can pull from that. And each piece started adding on for me. And then when I... I got asked by a friend of mine to go to Radical Media, a big production company in New York City, um, to work on this sports show. It was like, oh, well, there's a little bit of sports that I can kind of like tap into now. And we and we ended up selling the show to ESPN through Radical Media, but I, I stayed on as the music supervisor. And there was a budget to do the music. And I asked what would happen if we didn't spend all the money. And they said that the you could keep it, but you know, the goal was that I would spend most of it, but I had this network of young producers that I was talking about and young artists and young DJs. And I went to all of them and I said, look, I'm going to get your music all over ESPN, but we don't really have much money. I'm going to be able to put your name and credits at the end and this will help your career. And I started building up this pretty cool library, but along the way I was learning the music business and asking mm. people questions. You know, I would ask people, Things that most people are scared to ask, like how could I be in the music business and ask someone what what is ASCAP? What is a publishing deal? But you tell me one time and I'm never gonna forget it. So I kind of just kept building that way. And after I built this cool library of artists and did a handful of shows now at Radical Media, people like Mark Ronson and some of these other DJs and artists were like, well, Rich, why don't you stay on and manage us? Like you're bringing us all these shows. And then that's when I really doubled down on like managing artists now, I stopped doing the music supervision for TV and film. And I was an artist manager, you know, and that's when I got to meet Jay-Z and got to go over to Rock Nation. And, you know, and that's really like the whole journey there. So then how did you ricochet from that Rock Nation to then uh, sports then and, and, and beginning to even manage Kevin to even start this whole other journey? Yeah. Well, you know, the, the stuff I learned at Rock Nation life lessons, work lessons, way to conduct myself at times, you know, was priceless. And I was managing Solange, Meek Mill, D Nice, Mark Ronson. You know, we had in our studio in Soho, Amy Winehouse recording her album, Back to Black. There was so much around me that I, you know, like I told you, I'm cur I, I just learn and I throw myself into it and I develop real relationships with these with the town I was working with where they trust me and I, and I built, but I was learning myself as I went. And I will say that the comfort level that I felt managing artists felt 90% there. The fit felt 90%. And I knew somewhere in my mind that that wasn't like my destiny, that I really did have something that was going to make me feel more passion, but I loved it. You know, and I love being around this talent and I love being a rock nation. 
So that was my that was my music life. But finding myself in sports was going to happen. Right. So you liked the job. You liked what you were doing for the job, per se. But it wasn't in like it wasn't specifically what the area that you loved. Like you really had like a huge passion for sports. You love the music, but not like you love sports. Yeah. Basically. Well, look, I was managing Meek Mill. He was yeah. I, 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 I thought he was a superstar the second I met him. I was managing Mark Ronson, one of the, like yes. this generation's best producers. Wale has had 10 albums and Grammy nominations. The thing was though, when Mark Ronson would say to me, yo, come by the studio tonight, I wanna play you every song from the album. Like that didn't get me, that, that wasn't the same as when like, I got to go even to Kevin's first Nike skills camp. And I pulled up there, I went to like Foot Locker before because I didn't have the right hoop gear. And I was like, Oh, I'm home. Like just being in the gym made me feel that feeling because that was, you know, that was my escape from everything as a kid. And it still is. I'm the happiest watching, watching Kevin, watching basketball, watching sports in general. But the things that I learned in managing artists and what was happening in hip hop and the enterprises that were being built around Jay-Z and Puffy and Dr. Dre was really the blueprint for what has happened in sports now the last 10, 12 years anyway. So it afforded me this incredible experience to be like, well, not only was I in the music business, but I understand how you build this now, how if you're an artist and you're putting an album out, you got to support the album by doing all these other things. And then all these other things turn into potential new forms of business and revenue. And look what it culminates in Jay-Z, my God. And you were seeing LeBron starting to build what he was building, which no one had done that early in their career while they were playing. So when I went into sports, it was the right time. It was like 2012, Rock Nation was starting the agency and they let me do it. Like you gotta have dope people you work with that are like, yeah. I remember calling and saying, I, I wanna give up music. And like, they let me, that doesn't happen anywhere else. And right. when I went into sports, I was like, oh, okay, I get it. I get what he, I, athletes want to hear. I get what we're into. And, you know, and then God and timing, Kevin Durant was, you know, at a point in his life where he was looking for change and that, you know, we were very lucky. And I had a real relationship with him through Wale for years. And Jay-Z was there. Like, who wasn't going to come and take a right. shot at what we were doing, you know? So I think it was, it was a perfect storm. And I, at that point, I wasn't going to let anything get in the way of what I wanted to do in my life. Right. Perfect. So then basically you already had, you, you had a relationship with, uh, Kevin through Wale already. You were friends already. So it was like, you, it kind of just, that's how it kind of happened then through that whole relate friendship basically. Yeah. Oh, Wale introduced me to Kevin in 2008 and I stayed in touch here and there until 2012, 13, when we started working with him and, but there was enough of a trust factor there and, um, and he really was, you know, he had his eyes set on doing something differently. You know, like I said, he was, he had seen it in hip hop. He had seen it with LeBron and, you know, rock nation was that, and, you know, that coupled with the trust he had in, in our relationship, but also like the, how enamored he is with Jay and, and what they were building, you know, Kevin took the shot with our, with the agency and, you know, and I, I did that for Kevin at Rock Nation for three years. I was his um, agent and manager. And to be honest, I repped a handful of other athletes, too. And when I went to them and I said, I want to focus just on Kevin, they let me do it again. You know, and again, these are circumstances wow. that, that afforded me this. So then I was able to really hone in on it. And ultimately, I started as an entrepreneur and I knew I had to be an entrepreneur. And Kevin wanted his own thing. And that's really all that was, was it was time, you know, it was time for us to take a shot at doing something on our own. But, you know, I learned it all being around those guys and, 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 and like Kevin taking a shot at rock and, and what we built, built there catapulted like this next phase for us. Right. Wow. So I didn't realize that you had a bunch of other uh, sports client athletes as your clients. And then you yeah. kind of just really honed in on, on him for good reason. I mean, honestly, like he could probably keep you busy, just that one client for, you know, just on that, just, just to do the agency of that, not that, let alone all the businesses besides that. But cause I was going to say, I was going to ask you, did you want to ever just be a sports agent? Let's say when you were a kid or just yeah. that, cause that to oh me, I, right. Cause that to me, right. Cause yeah. what you love to do. Um, 
I always and, wanted to be a sports agent, but by the time I got there, I realized the business had changed. So, you know, honing in with Kevin had to do with a, obviously it was Kevin B he wanted that. And he wanted me to hone in on him, which is a big part of it. And then C, I knew I wanted to build a business. I didn't, at that point in my career, I was 36, you know, I'm 45 now. I didn't want to spend the next rest. Of, I didn't want to just be an agent. Um, because I wanted to build my own business and I didn't think I could do both at that time, you know? Right. So what was the big, I feel like, do you, I, I feel like, and obviously you can tell me if you, what, what was the change? Like, I feel that athletes now, it used to be they would do endorsement deals and like, they would do like those types of partnerships. But I feel now like it's the trend for top athletes to now start their own funds and to own pieces of these businesses. And that be that's become like a whole, you know, a whole business on its own. Um, what do you think it was because of social media? Do you think it was just because of more information, the access that people have now to what's available to them? Yeah, I think it's a culmination of all that. And I think, you know, um, these young athletes are as aware and educated about business as anyone that you'll meet men, women at that age, um, young men and women athletes are so locked in on themselves, their business, what's who they need to have around them. And most 18 and 19, 20 year olds don't know that information. So you're already dealing with pretty astute business minds. Then you talk about like the trend and who these young athletes have grown up seeing it's been, these entrepreneurs that have built business and done this and, and own their own brands and own their own rights and build things in their own name. They see what Rich Paul's done. They see what LeBron and Maverick have done and what Kevin has done and what Steph Curry has done and what, you know, Tom Brady's doing. They see what, um, you know, uh, the big entrepreneurs in hip hop have done. And that's already embedded in, you know, how these young people are being raised now. And then, coupled in with the whole change in social media and now NFT and blockchain, they're, they're coming into this as we have the power and we have the fan base and we have the ability to control that and monetize that. And I think it's just an evolution in it, you know, and I think it's, it, it's not for everybody at every level and doing brand deals. If you believe in those brands or you want to get your face out there, it's not a bad thing. You know, sometimes some young athletes will be like, I'm not trying to do any brand deals. I just want to do equity. And it's like, it's not as it's not black or white like that. It's more about how you approach building your business. So if you get a, I mean, LeBron James, the biggest business athlete of them all, still does brand deals. There's nothing wrong with doing brand deals. It's about understanding your work to the brand. You're not going to get equity in Pepsi. So right. it's like you can get paid. But at the same time, what do you want to invest in? And then with what you invest in, what is on brand with your organization. So you want to do more for it. Like we have 80 companies in our portfolio. We don't, we don't publicly promote every single one, but we're strategic and helpful and advised with all of them as they want. Some of them we are more active with. And you know, some of them we put more money into because we do want more equity. You got to look at it as part of the big picture because what's having equity in a company that you don't believe in or that you don't think is going to work or that doesn't work. It's not worth anything. Absolutely. How do you guys pick your, how do you guys pick the companies that you're going to invest in? You've had some great wins. Coinbase is one of the companies. Postmates is another one. Was it a Robin Hood? Uh, I mean, you have like, Thera, is it Therabody that you guys do? You, go, you guys do yeah. Therabody. I mean, you guys have had a lot, I'm sure you've had a lot of dogs also, but you also have picked very well. Um, is there a type, do, do you like have like a checklist that you like to go over? Is it more about like what, what feels natural to. Yeah. Like well, I'll be honest with you. I, we haven't had a lot of dogs. Um, you have out of 80 companies, really? No, I mean, of course. I mean, that's it, amazing. You know, some of them are still obviously maturing and some of them are still building and some of them may ultimately not pay out. But I, I wouldn't say that we have a lot of dogs. I think that we were able to build up a really great network first of deal flow and pipeline from institutions. And we proved ourselves as really good strategic investors. And obviously, um, you know, Kevin being associated with the uh, certain brands allowed us to have even more value and more access. And then as we really proved it more and more, we've got deal flow from founders. And when founders start recommending you to other founders, then you're really starting to get great deals and 
really starting to build a network. But I also see all these founders and all these companies as partners in helping, you know, what we're building and what we're doing. And I use our media platform boardroom as an advantage and a complement to help these portfolio companies. And those companies give me information to help us build our platform. And, you know, I think that when we see these companies, they're usually earlier stage. It's not deal terms to really go deep into. Um, so we've analyzed it based on what we know about the market, about how we feel about the founder, how we feel about the company in general, whether we get it, whether we like it, whether we see it working. And then obviously some of it is instinct and, and gut, especially early on. And, you know, I think that sounds easier said, but again, if you, you know, from memory and from reading people and from like visualizing, if I believe like I could see this working, like I see where this fits, I see where this works, this guy can do this. What he's saying sounds like the guy or the woman that I spoke to at this company when they were successful. And I really do pull from all that, you know, and try to make a read on it. And then some of them, uh, you know, are just good deals and you'd be kind of uh, doing the wrong job if you didn't see that they were good deals, you know? Well, how early stage do you guys get in? How early? Sometimes C, Series A, Sometimes rounds a little bit later on, but even if that's the case, we're probably not making a sizable check. It's more about the alignment with the company. We've done some pipe investments, but those pipe investments have been strategic. So some of the companies we've invested into in the pipe have become partners or investors back in our platform. So, you know, I think for the most part, our focus is early stage, but there's been some creativity to how we've invested in some late stage, late stage companies. Do you see any, I mean, right now, everything is about like Bitcoin and crypto and NFTs. I mean, you guys jumped on the bandwagon of Coinbase a long time ago. I mean, and now you guys have another, don't you guys do another partnership with them where you provide content for their platform or? Yeah, well, that's a good example of like the flywheel we try to create them and Dapper Labs were companies we invested in and then in working with them and, and being as hands-on as they needed us to be, we built up to a relationship where they could then, you know, turn around and go, all right, we want to sponsor your platform. We want to pay Kevin to be in a commercial. We want to program and activate it. You know, your center in PG County to the kids in the college track program. So that, that was that kind of culmination of company that invested and now investing back in us, Dapper Labs. Similarly, we invested in their company and now they're a partner of boardroom and you know, I think that shows a little bit of just like where we see the business going to some degree. And hopefully there's more of those companies and that kind of like tidal wave effect is part of how we grow the business. Uh, so, OK, so then how, when you guys started, when you guys first thought of 35 Venture, what, why 35? Was it because Kevin's number was 35 for a bit of time or? Yeah, I mean, at the time, like. In order, we didn't really have, when we left to start our own business, um, we really were starting from scratch. We were um, getting rid of all his brand deals and it was just Nike and his, obviously his on court. So before we decided to do anything and really create anything or build anything or start thinking of what we wanted to do in media or brand, we started investing in venture and, you know, Kevin's number is 35. And at that point, we were really focused on ventures. It's really evolved to the point where the company is called 35B. There's a venture fund, not fun, there's a venture business under 35V Parent Co., but then there's boardroom under Parent Co., and we've got a handful of other media properties and docs and scripted series, and we have some small ownership and a handful of like professional sports teams, but just in soccer and so far because you know we have to grow into <laughs> that yeah. next phase, but we've put it all under one company and because of that we changed it to 35v because the ventures always alluded to thinking we were just oh. a vc but you know no exactly did you ever oh, think it's no 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 it's not i mean listen did you think when you first started it was going to grow and evolve to this mat like i feel like you have so much it's an umbrella company really you have so much yeah. under it right i yeah, love the boardroom really by the way i just want to have, honestly like really i knew i wanted to do well like i really wanted to be regarded for doing well i wanted to do well by kevin i wanted to get real wins on the board and put quality work out and then like keep my head down and then as it started to unfold see like the puzzle pieces and then you know as we grew it it was like oh, okay well we can create a separate company called boardroom or then it's like oh well we should invest in this and then as you start to see it unfold more and more start going, well, all right, well, now this all works together. And that's kind of how 
like now we're thinking in parent company, but when we started, it was, you know, I was really thinking about it step by step. You know, I wanted to be a great manager and do my job and then let's do great investments. And then, oh, okay, we're going to do a documentary. Well, let's make that great. And I figure if we just do that, great work will pile up. Right. How many people do you have working now at, at 35V? <laughs> 40. <laughs> How many? 40? 40. Wow. Okay. So, cause, so how do you split your time then? Because just being a manager for someone that's like such a super, such a superstar is so time consuming. Then you have this business that you oversee. Are you really involved in the minutia or like, how does, like, give me a day in the life of you. Like what time do you I'm wake involved, up? I'm involved what, in every bit of minutia and I don't work 24 seven at all because I really value balance. I really value my family. I like to value my time. And we have 40 people, like I said, and I'm conscious of what we take on. I would never do something I couldn't do. I would never want to feel bogged down. There is no dollar amount or like place I can get that's worth that for me. I don't want to feel that way. I love what I do. And I keep adding on things that I love doing and that Kevin loves doing and that are natural to him and I and to everyone that works here. And we have this incredible staff of like really creative entrepreneurial people as well. And it works. Um, and it's all very intertwined. I wake up early um, during the week. What's uh, early? Are we talking five in the morning? Are we talking? No, no, no. I'm not like some nut that like wakes up and runs a half marathon. I wake up at like six, six thirty in the morning. Okay. And I don't really, I play tennis, but you know, like one or two times a week. I work out with this guy who I really don't work out. He's supposed to be working me out, but all I ask him to do is stretch me for an hour and 10 minutes, but it makes me feel good. Okay. Uh, every day? Every day? I, you work? No, not every day. I see him once a week. I play tennis once or twice a week. I go to the office when I'm in New York from like 9, 9.30 till 7. I go out for lunches sometimes. People come here. I go out for dinner, for work one or two nights a week. I go to the net games. On the weekends, I really like, I'm more of a family man. And I'm always on though. Like I have my phone on me all the time. I speak to people. My work is so much my passion that I can do it and be a present dad and present husband and manager to Kevin, like you said, and do it to the like level that he needs. I don't, I don't phone any of it in, but if it ever gets to where it's too much, I won't, you know, I won't take it up. So of all the stuff that you're working on, you have the vet, you have the, um, the companies, obviously, do you see, by the way, do you see any, is there a, besides of course, you're going to probably going to say like crypto, but, um, and you can, uh, is there an area or a niche that you see a trending that you really are passionate about that you think that it's going to, that, that you want to focus on more? Well, it's, you know, the, the good thing is, is, um, what I realized during the pandemic was I don't like that feeling. I don't want to ever feel like I have to try to keep up with anything. I don't want to ever feel like I like miss or have to chase anything. As long as I stay informed and as long as I'm in the conversation and I, and I have visibility into what's happening. So the way we started building our platform during the pandemic was as everyone was starting to like make big bets and trading card space and venture space and create their own NFTs and their own drops and buying and selling different tokens and coins. I told everybody, let me cover it. Let me tell everyone what you're working on. Let me give you flowers. Let me promote your NFT drop, your new investment, your new company. And I was also investing in these companies too. So it was giving me a lot of access and visibility. But in terms of what we were going to do in this space, I've still been really thoughtful. We haven't put out an NFT yet. Um, you know, we do have a partner in Coinbase and Dapper, but I'm not, you know, trying to be the, the, uh, the, person moving the needle of like what's happening in the space that there are people that do that, but we're, we're in it. And I think that what I love is all of it. I love the energy around all of it. I love the intersection. I love that tech and art and fashion and music and sports and, and finance can be in one conversation. That was the point of boardroom was that the way it looked in a room now is people in sweats, and people that can talk any language, they may not have finished college, they understand and they're connected and they're in touch. And to me, like, I want to stay in touch. I don't want to be out of touch. I don't want to be irrelevant and disconnected. So I stay completely locked in and in touch and just want to have a seat in it. So I just love all of it. 
But I will tell you that like what I don't forget is the fact that KD opened so many doors for me. So many people did along the way. Uh, but I did, I did hustle for those doors to be open. I had to let these people know that I was worthy of that door opening, but they supported me and pushed me. And my job with Kevin, if I could pull one thing out of the fire, if it was all burning down is always going to be what I choose. It's going to be helping him build this foundation and his organization and helping him and his family and building his life because I'm cognizant of, you know, some of the ways in which I got here and that's how much I care about him. But you know, there's not one thing I love more than anything else. Boardroom to me embodies me more than anything I've ever worked on. You know, it feels like me and that part I love. Um, but, you know, I love I love sports still. Like at the end of the day, I love being around that. So, you know, I'd love to do that at one point in my life only again. Would you ever would you expand by even having a more of a sports agency within 35V and like getting other people underneath to be representing different athletes or do you have a. And do you, it, like, I know you have this show on, on Apple TV and where you were up for an Oscar. Wasn't he up for, or he won the Oscar for something else? Well, that we EP'd won an Oscar uh, for best short film last year. We don't get an Oscar because we are just the EPs, but. Right, right. But I felt pride in it because we read the script very early. <clears throat> we were some of the first people to invest in it. Um, but uh, yeah, what, what was the question in regards no, my to question, My first question oh, was. Other, other athletes. Not really. I mean, the thing is, is I work with so many athletes already, like helping in different ways, whether it's through venture or whether it's through sharing a deal or working with boardroom. I mean, we work with so many athletes that I get to collaborate with so many of them um, that it would have to be one person where he or she was like, I want in their world. And if they wanted in our world and it was somebody that I aligned with, I would do it. But I can't rebuild because we built a business, you know, we mm -hmm. built something that Kevin's my business partner in. And we also happen to have a relationship where I'm his manager, but I couldn't do that again. That would be two different businesses I would be running. So I, it would only be if an athlete was like, you know what? I'm down with Kevin and Rich. I want in. I want to be around boardroom. I want their venture deals. I want Rich to work with my team. And if that worked, I'd do it right sport, right person. I would do it. Right. And then the, do you have a production arm or because of this, the show or whatever, like how, how what's, what's your neck? What's the next iteration of what you're doing? Well, let's just keep growing. We're, we're, I'm raising money at the parent company level now to build more investments out. I'm building boardroom out, building new IP and, and different brands. But, um, you know, the, the stuff we produce for boardroom, we produce, but the, you know, Apple show or the documentaries that we do or, you know, we have an incredible doc coming out on Showtime, but we partner with a director and producer that we loved and we're all hands on and all over it. And it was our idea, but we still very much like delegate the production and making of the docs and series to our partners. Boardroom content, we make all of it. I'm so surprised that you haven't done an NFT yet. That is very shocking. Well, we're putting one out and we, we have two or three coming out in the next like few months. But yeah, I mean, we haven't put out our own, no. Because I feel like everybody and their dog is now doing that, right? Because it seems yeah. to be such a big money maker, if, well, especially someone of his caliber and his size, right? So yeah, but you know, the, the, there's no window. There's no window to do it. So like now, you know, I'm armed with more information, and I've seen it. And I, I, the, Kevin, not now, any celebrity was going to have the ability to recreate Board Eight or recreate World of Women. So it's really about you know, being patient and thoughtful about how you're going to enter in the market. And we were involved in so many other ways that we were in it. So to put an NFT out, I felt more of a responsibility to do right by Kevin. So the first one we're putting out is more of like an art project that he happens to be the subject of the NFT. So for, it, it was a photography piece that we did. So there's more thought to it in that way. But I think there's opportunity, obviously, eventually, as we build boardroom out and there's new iterations of how we create one destination for all of it, that there will be more frequent drops here and there, and you know, across all of our IP. So do you, you stay in New York most of the time? Do you, is your office solely in New York? Do you have offices, let's say in Cal in LA or San Francisco? Or I, what was that? We're not that big yet. Not that big yeah. yet is the, is the offer. Yeah, well, I mean, or, you know, hopefully we will be, but I, maybe not, you know, I, I don't know. I'm, I don't know if I want to have 500 and plus not who I am, but, you know, I love this team we have here, and I think you can scale 
and build without having to like necessarily do it with having offices in, in our business. There's some businesses yeah. that have to do that, but um, I will tell you though, Miami life is very, I, I can, I can rock with that. So I would potentially open an office there. Right. Well, also to na- and these days, I think with COVID and everything's taught everybody, you don't have to be in an office. You can be doing this type of yeah. virtual thing or just work from your home. And it's, you know, the overhead alone that you save is just remarkable. Exactly. Time. Right. Well, that was the test. That's what, that's why during the pandemic, the people that network by chasing every party and the people that network by traveling to every event and really not having any real responsibility back home, or if they didn't have a family, then, you know, if they did have a family, they just didn't care. All those people that always ran around and chased to network. Now all of a sudden they had to really network, they had to network with relationships and real substance. And to me, that's when I locked in. Cause I was like, Oh shit, I don't have to travel to do this. This is, you know, the one maybe silver lining of an awful time was that I really valued my, these relationships that I've built. So when I reached out and wanted to have a conversation, someone would get on the phone with me for 45 minutes and talk on the zoom while we were building. I didn't have to go travel and, you know, make sure that I didn't miss anything to show up and be in front of people. Cause that's one way of networking. The other way is really valuing those relationships, really having the relationship where it's something you can build and learn from. I don't, get a lot from most of my network. I don't ask the most like powerful people that I've been able to really build with and get close with. I don't ask them for anything. I mean, I'm getting everything from them. I got to sit with Pat Riley in Miami for two hours, you know, uh, two weeks ago, a week ago, I wouldn't ask him for anything because that was a gift for me. And like, when I get to meet and talk to some of these people that I've got to know, and my God, like, so, you know, that's how you build a real relationship in my opinion. Yeah, I think that you've said that, you know, you've kind of made mention of relationships and the value of them so many times that I feel like to me, what I walk away from this podcast with is that that is like the core of like who you are and why you're of of your success. So can you maybe give my listeners just a couple or a couple of pointers on how to truly build valuable, I mean, real relationships, not these like superficial nonsense where it's like, Hey, Hey, but like really build true relationships with people. I think you said it a little bit by saying not to ask for things, you know, not to be someone who just can, what can I get from you? What can I get from you? I think that's a good point that you mentioned. Is there anything else that you can think of? Uh, That's a good question. I mean, I'll try my best. I wouldn't necessarily call these like my three rules on like relationship building because I don't know if I have enough cred to be able to do that. But I do think that for me, at least, I've really always thought about this. There's an analogy that I use a lot, like when Michael Jordan was playing and um, people would reference how the whole game moves in slow motion for him. Uh, And that always kind of like stuck with me. And it was like, oh, well, I guess if it's all moving in slow motion, it's like your mind is slowing down. And I really hated that feeling as a kid when I was anxious or stressed out and like too much to handle was very stressful. So I try to consciously be aware that like the person I'm talking to, it doesn't matter if it's you know President Obama, like most people want to have a regular conversation and really appreciate when people you know, say certain things and, and and ask you about yourself and ask you about your family. And it's not cliche. It's like, these are just human beings. And I think that if you go into a relationship, just trying to make, um, you know, uh, an impression and to be okay with that and not feel like you got to get a follow-up meeting or get an email or, you know, make sure that you don't leave there without them hearing your business. That's not what it's about. Like really try to be patient and spend time building these relationships and valuing like the opportunity to meet these people and let them remember you, you know, and, and, and take an inventory of who you meet and who they are. And then you can shoot a note and don't ask for anything, shoot a note. And people are, people are going to be, you know, people are going to be more responsive nowadays because they have their phone by their head. You know, like when we were coming up, I had to call someone, leave a message and hope Lior Cohen was going to call me back. And then if they didn't, I was cool with it. Now people are like offended. You know, someone writes me an email and wants to meet with me and then they send me like question marks six days later. And it's like, I would, I, if I had ever done that to some of these people I looked up to, I would have been kicked to the curb. But, you know, I, I, like I said, it's tough to feel that way. You feel like, oh, I got my moment in front of this person, but just slow down, make the connection, keep building, 
keep observant, be in control, you know, don't get, don't, don't ever get out of control. You got to stay in control. But if someone is okay. And then what's the next move, right? Because if someone obviously wants to be, be, you know, become an agent or do what you're doing, that's good. That's great advice. But then what, right? So you're saying be patient. Is there, what do they do next? What's the next oh, move? So that was just me explaining to you how to network a bit. Right, right, right. right. But I think question. that was a tough question because those are things that it's really you could never explain. So at least for me, I just was always cognizant of being chill. Like, don't try to just be too extra. That's number one. In terms of like going for it, you got to go for it. Like you have to go for it. You got I did send that email. I did call Lior Cohen four months after that. And I did stay on it. And then when I did see them the second time, I said, look, I would love to get a minute of your time. I would love to do this. But I stayed so informed on what they were doing, on what they were working on, what they had in the works, because people want to talk about their own stuff. So I would make it sometimes about not what I had, but what I wanted to learn more about what they were doing and understand what they were building. And people will let you in on that. And if they don't, then you got to keep it moving. You know, and I think that's like the second stage in starting to build that network. And listen, the third thing is there's a little bit of a reckless abandon. And it, it, it doesn't mean that you're not chill, like I said in the first one. But there's a little bit of like, why not me? Like, I'm going for it. I'm going to go for it. And sometimes, you know, when you're young, whenever I had an idea for a business, I would be like, let's make T-shirts. I was just like, tell anyone around me, let's print up a T-shirt of what my idea is because it needed to feel real. And when it felt real, people saw it and the optics matter. And people were like, man, this shit is real. He's real. He's building a restaurant. I never built any of those restaurant ideas I had. But all the kids I grew up with are like, remember that thing you did, that element when you made the T-shirts? It was real to them for a minute. And I think that like you got to go for it and you got to really believe that what you're doing is real, like that what you're building can happen, that you can do it. So, you know, I, I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's really like some of how I've approached a lot of this. Is there someone that you have not met yet that you want to meet still? Well, yeah, but I, I, I'd have to really think about like offhand. Um, I've never really, um, hmm. Never met Denzel Washington. I think he's cool as hell. You haven't met him yet. Wow. Okay. I would no. think because no one will not take your call, right? Because of Kevin. No, I don't think that's true. Well, I, 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 well most, take my call. I think people, I mean, listen, I think he, he's a, people are, who's not a sport? I mean, who's not a huge basketball fan of someone who like that? I mean, I would think that if there's an opportunity, uh, for that alone, maybe not everybody, a lot of people. Okay. You're right. I shouldn't be, I, I wouldn't say that, but, um, I was just curious if there's anybody you have not met yet that you would like to meet or is there, who is, who have you met? Who's been the most impressive to you? Well, some of the people that have like inspired me, this guy, John came in at radical media who gave me a shot. Jimmy Iovine has inspired me greatly. Jay Z's inspired me greatly. Steve Stout has inspired me greatly. Um, my friend Eddie Q has inspired me greatly. Kevin's inspired me greatly. Um, this guy I met when I first went to San Francisco, the famous investor, Ron Conway, helped me greatly. Lorene Powell Jobs helped me uh, understand where to take my business from a philanthropic standpoint and how to approach it. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I went with Kevin to the White House when, o when Obama was there, but he took Kevin in the room privately. So I didn't oh. get a chance to meet him. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I think that'd be cool. Um, there's other people because there's people like not famous people, you know, that I would love to meet. And uh, there's just people that I've like heard their stories along the way that aren't famous people that have inspired me. Um, I got to meet David Letterman last year. That was pretty cool because Kevin's on uh, my next guest is. But those things like, the, to be honest, the things that I find cool are like players that were like, stars when I was like a teenager, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. They, they want to talk to me, but I'm really like, I can't believe I'm talking to you. <laughs> I, I'm not that, you know, I'm not that deep. Unfortunately, a lot at the end of the day, a lot of those guys are really what like excites me. You know? 
do you read? Like, what are some of your hobbies besides sports or besides what you do? Is there something like, tell me something or tell us something about you that you, that maybe otherwise people would um, be shocked to hear? Well, you wouldn't be shocked. I, I love watching documentaries. Um, What's your favorite? Are you watching a TV series right now? What's your favorite book? Yeah, TV all, these, series? Like, all these like tech um, scripted series, like the We Crash series is fire. Super Pumped is good. I'm watching the Theranos scripted series on Hulu. My wife had me watching the Amy Schumer show the other day. It was pretty funny. Um, but honestly, I don't have my attention span is odd because it's like I'm doing a lot of things at one time. And sometimes I don't give the shows like the full attention I should. I made a I made a decision that I'm not going to stress myself until I'm 50 about focusing a bit more on some of those things because I love all this like my kids being young and being around them and like their conversations that is exciting to me. My friends being around my friends, helping my friends being around my family. That really does genuinely excite me and being around my business. Like I get to go to, I'm going to another basketball game tonight and I get to sit with my feet on the floor. And I used to sit all the way up, not on some, like this isn't a Spike Lee story, but I sat all the way up and I stared down and I wanted to be the people that had those seats. So it's like, I really do love all this stuff. Um, I love playing tennis. I love watching sports. I love hip hop and like, you know, the whole culture in and around it still. But my friendships and my relationships and keeping in touch with people and checking in with people, that really fills me up. Like I really, I really am re get rewarded from like someone calling me that wants to talk to me and I can spend two hours talking to them. I really do enjoy that because I learn myself still while I'm doing it. No, I understand that. How old are your kids, by the way? 12 and 8. Nice. I have a 9-year-old and a 7-year-old. Um, that's great. I mean, listen, I think that this is great. I, I feel like I've taken up a lot of your time over an hour already, and I, I really appreciate you coming on and, and giving us some insight into what you do, how you've done it. And I think I think you're good to – I think we're good to go. I think you're free. You're free to go call your friends or do whatever you want to do. Work, <laughs> work, whatever. Exactly. Did I answer everything okay? Was I too long winded for you? No, you were great. I mean, I think like I, I think you answered really everything. I just, I, I was, I was going to ask you more about your, uh, about your investments. Like, are you doing more health and wellness? Are you going to be doing more, bit, more crypto? But I think, like, I is can there answer any that for you. I can okay. answer that in a good soundbite you can use. Yeah. Okay. I have a couple different sound. I mean, yeah. Okay. Do that. That would be great. Do you want to do that? Well, I think, you know, early on when we were investing, we were able to see a lot more of a wide variety of companies. And I didn't think we had any thing to stand on to say this was our focus. So I really just like was seeing a whole mix of companies and was able to understand a whole different variety of sectors. And it was pretty helpful. I think now that moving back to New York and Kevin coming to play here, and I always lived here, but having our business really grow here, and because of what we're doing in media, there is a little bit more of a focus around some of the things we see in these like kind of, um, you know, these like innovative companies in and around sports and blockchain and crypto. But we still see things sometimes that are just like, you know, a business that's trying to reinvent uh, pet health. You know, like there's things we still see. And if I'm inspired by a founder or there's synergies that I think that we as a company can be beneficial, we'll still look at it. I have a bunch of companies for you, actually, that you should look for in the health and wellness space. Who does your deal flow? Like mm -hmm. who? Who kind of like who kind of oversees it? Do you have people who oversee in the in in the health and wellness, in the crypto, in the pet health, or it's just like blah everything? And then like uh, it's not. there's an organization that there's like of the forty people, there's like maybe five or six that work closely with me on the deals, but like you know. I'd say probably 80% of the deal flow is initiated by everything we've talked about. Like if I didn't get deal flow from everything I just said. Yeah. You're going to get so much deal flow. Yeah, yeah. Like that's. It's a hundred percent true. But then do you have somebody to like suss through? Like I would yeah. imagine you get so. Um, well, I mean, so when the emails come to me, if it's somebody within one bucket of relationship, I'm interacting and then copying my team on. And if it's in another bucket of interaction or a cold email or it comes through some source that seems real, but I don't know these people, I forward it to the two closest people with me in this group. And then when we get a little bit closer to making a decision, 
I'll bounce some things off KD if it's appropriate at a certain investment and we make a decision, you know, and um, we have financial advisors and we have different people to pull from, but it's that small group um, that does it. And it is a lot of deal flow, but you know, I, it's not inundating us to the point where we can't do it, but it's a lot. I'm sure. So if, if people want to know more about 35 V uh, where do they go? Or you, do you have, or like, let's, they can listen to your podcast out of the, out of yeah, the yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I would love everyone that listens to your platform to, to go to boardroom.tv. There's incredible content in all forms that they can engage with. And I think it's starting to grow in its, in its tone. So there's a lot for everybody. We're going into music now a bit, which is cool, full circle uh, moment. Um, and then we, you know, you can see kind of the body of other things we do on 35 mentorscom if you want, but you know, or just listen to this pod that you and I just did. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Well, you've been so great. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Habits and hustle, time to get it rolling. Stay up on the grind, don't stop, keep it going. Habits and hustle from nothing into something. All out, hosted by Jennifer Cohen. Visionaries, tune in, you can get to know them. Be inspired, this is your moment. Excuses, we ain't having that. The Habits and Hustle Podcast, powered by Habit Nest.